Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for the first SIC Geotechnical Division online event for 2021. Today's lecture will be given by Dr. Charles McRobert from the University of Stellenbosch, and the topic will be the effect of internal erosion on the mechanical behavior of soils, which is Dr. McRobert's completed PhD research study. Before we start with the lecture, I just want to run through a few formalities. The GeoDiv will try host four evening, or in this case, I should say afternoon lectures every year, so generally one every quarter. All the RSVPs to the lectures are recorded and web links are sent out closer to the event date with a final reminder on the day of the event. The topics obviously vary. Last year, we had a big focus on back to basics, which were very well attended. This year, we have actually asked some academics such as Dr. McRobert if they would be willing to present on their research topic. And Dr. McRobert, we really appreciate your time and willingness to take this on. The lectures will usually run for about 45 minutes to an hour, following which we will open up the Q&A at the end. Questions posted can be posted anonymously. We will generally allow 15 to 20 minutes for questions. Towards the end of the lecture and the new option this year, I will post an attendance register link that we would like you to fill out. This is for CPD points and the information is kept confidential. Online lectures will be awarded between 0.1 and 0.2 CPD points. Okay, so that's it from a general info point of view. If I may now introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Charles McRobert. Charles was born and raised in Zimbabwe, spending most of his childhood in the rural farming regions. His interest in civil engineering was sparked by his civil engineering grandfather. His interest in soils can be traced to his father, who is an agricultural researcher, and his role as a teacher to his mother, a high school biology teacher. When he set off for UCT for undergraduate studies, his grandfather handed him a Frankie Blue Book. His grandfather told him this was the most recent book he had received before retiring. This more or less sealed Charles's fate as a geotechnical engineer. After graduating, he moved to Johannesburg to work for the Anglo-American Technical Division. He was rapidly exposed and given increasingly responsibility for technical aspects relating to tailings. His work took him to the far corners of South Africa, Botswana, Brazil and Chile. While at Anglo, he completed, he completed his master's by research at WIT under Prof. Jeff Blight. When handing in his final dissertation, then Head of Civil and Environmental Engineering, Prof. Mitch Garnett, asked Charles if he would consider joining the academic staff at WITS. At WITS, Charles completed his PhD under the guidance of Dr. Irvin Luca, Prof. Peter Day, and Prof. Chris James. This work will be the subject of today's lecture. In 2019, he moved to Stellenbosch to help maintain and build up their postgraduate offerings in geotechnical engineering. In 2020, he was made head of the Geotechnical, Management and Transport Division of Civil Engineering. As well as being an academic, he is an active consultant on the characterization and modeling of geomaterials for global stability and seepage assessments, with particular emphasis on industrial and mining residue facilities. His family, woodwork and gardening keep him busy the rest of the time. A quote by Sir Edmund Hambly, former ICE president, guides much of what he does. If you are going to be wrong, in any case, it is better to be wrong in a simple way than in a complicated way. And with that, Dr. McRobert, I hand over to you. Thank you. Hi. Um, I must say this is quite a novel experience. Um, talking to two computer screens um, and uh, I hope you all can hear me. Um, thank you for the, the kind introduction um, and hopefully I can deliver on the topic that is um, before us today. Um, so just um, a quick run through of the contents um, of the presentation that we're going to be um, looking at today. The, the first topic that we're going to be looking at is shear strength. 
Um, and then after that, we will look at internal erosion. Um, and then we will then look at um, coupling internal erosion and shear strength. Um, and that really was the subject of my research. And then at the end, um, we will bring this all together in a conclusion. So this was a, a picture that I saw on the internet a while ago. Um, and often in geotechnical engineering, we um, can feel um, a bit uncertain about what we're doing. Um, and I thought that this um, little illustration uh, maybe gives us um, a reason to not feel ashamed by the difficulties that we face in trying to model sand. Um, and this was the opinion of a, a physicist. Um, and so he, um, he um, uh, Dylan Munro, is of the opinion that sand is actually far more complicated um, than quantum mechanics or general relativity. So moving on um, to shear strength. Now, the shear strength that is developed in soils, um, and we predominantly looking at granular materials, but actually fine materials behave in a similar way as well. Um, we have three components um, to shear strength. Um, these components are rolling, sliding, and particle interlock. Now, the first two um, are often lumped together um, because it is difficult to differentiate rolling from sliding. Um, and particle interlock um, is related to the density of the soil. So the higher the density, the greater the particle interlock. So those three components make up um, the shear strength of a soil. Now, the discussion that we'll be having today will largely revolve around the direct shear uh, mode of failure. Um, and that's because um, for my research, I used the direct shear box for my research. Um, and so we're going to be looking predominantly at the micro aspects of soil behavior. So really looking at soils as particles and looking at their behavior at um, a particle at the particle size range. And um, often in geotechnical practice, we look at the macro um, effects, so um, nice big slopes, uh, whereas we've, and that can sometimes uh, lead us to forget that the actual soil is made up of particles. So just in front of us here, we have um, two assemblages of um, particles, and I hope you can see my um, pointer. Um, and we have assemblage A, which is loose, where we've got the particles as far apart from each other, but still touching. Um, and we've got assemblage B, where the particles are um, close, as close as possible to each other. And we are going to shear these two soils, and obviously there would be an applied normal um, force on both of these assemblages. So I'm sure we can fairly um, confidently say that it would be assemblage B that would have the higher shear resistance. Um, but perhaps what you can think about is why, why will this assemblage have a higher strength than assemblage uh, A? Uh, and something else you can think about is what, what will happen to the volume or the height of this failing surface um, during the shearing um, that will take place. Um, so hopefully by the end, uh, you will have a, a better idea of what will happen in those two cases. So there are various um, models that have been proposed um, to estimate shear strength of granular materials. Um, and this article here by Salgado and company in 2000 is a, has a great um, summary at the beginning of these various models. So if you are interested uh, in understanding them further, you can find that paper. Um, but th that sharing can be envisaged as a, um, a sawtooth movement. Um, so the sliding and rolling is the um, resistance if there were no saw teeth. Um, so if that angle I was zero. Um, then that would be your um, phi C or your critical friction angle um, and psi 
um, the dilation angle, which is basically the same as I, uh, would be then the additional strength that results from those teeth. So that there is a critical state friction angle, and that basically depends on the material and is within a fairly narrow range. The dilation angle um, is there. Now, that is obviously a very simple model, um, and Taylor in 1948, um, using an energy correction hypothesis, um, suggested that um, tan phi, so that's the, the peak friction angle, um, can be estimated as the tan of the critical friction angle plus tan of the dilation angle. Um, now, this is the dilation angle in relation to direct shear. Um, so, Rho and de Joslin de Jong um, in 1962 and then in 1976 developed a further method um, that's a bit more complicated, uh, and there they have N equals M times NC, where N is a flow number, M is a dilatancy number, uh, and NC is a critical state flow number. So NC is basically re related to that friction angle, um, M is related to the uh, dilation angle, and N to the peak friction angle. Um, and these can be converted to these parameters. And if you look at the formulas, they, they look fairly similar to your active um, the formula you use to work out your active pressure and coefficient. Um, this model, um, well, the development progressed with Bolton um, in 1986, uh, who proposed a, a very simple model based on a review of a large number of triaxial and plain strain tests. Uh, and the relationship that Bolton proposed with that was at the peak friction angle uh, is equal to the critical state friction angle plus 0.8 times the dilation angle. Uh, he also proposed a second model, which was a bit um, more complicated, um, that got away from the dilation angle. Um, but he had two different equations, one for plane strain and one for triaxial strain. Um, and these IR values are a function of relative density of the soil and the effective stress and ranges between zero and four. Um, so the, the, the practical importance of these two equations is firstly that the peak friction angle can, is higher in plane strain, e.g. in an embankment versus in a triaxial. So if you're doing a stability analysis with triaxial results, um, you are building in a little bit of conservatism because the strength in actuality will be a little bit higher in the plane strain condition. Um, and it can also um, help you decide whether a peak friction angle um, that you have got reported from a lab is realistic. Um, so if you set IR to four, um, you can sort of determine what the maximum um, friction angles that that material could develop. But I guess, I guess the one question is, so what if Bolton um, gave us this relationship? How does this actually help us uh, in practical engineering? Um, and the reason that it's such a useful relationship um, to have, and it's something that you can easily remember, um, is that it's a convenient way to check laboratory results. So uh, this is a, a picture of the um, direct shear box equipment that I, I use for my PhD work. Um, it was somewhat complicated compared to the typical equipment in that the top half of the box, box was restrained, um, and that was so that the top cap um, would not rotate. Now, if you've ever done direct shear box testing with very coarse material, you'll know that um, during the uh, shearing process, there's a lot of dilation that takes place. Um, and that dilation, if you think back to those saw teeth, the, the saw tooth model um, is basically at causes the material to move at an angle um, or to dilate at an angle. So you find that this top cap, top cap rotates during the shearing process. Um, so this adaptation that I developed um, was to prevent that top cap from rotating. Now, one of the problems with this change in boundary conditions is that um, when the material dilates, um, it actually pushes against the sides of the box. 
um, as it dilates. Um, and so you have um, load, um, normal load, um, being transferred to the sides. Um, and as a consequence of that, um, the friction at the sides of the boxes can have a significant influence on your um, shear results. So when I was um, calibrating this device and figuring out how it was working, um, I investigated different ways of providing lubrication on the sides of the um, box. Uh, and the first, the first method that I used was using um, Vaseline or petroleum jelly on the sides. Um, and then um, I also then investigated using um, basically the triaxial um, membranes, the latex membranes um, that you use on the sides and using silicone grease um, between, so silicone grease on the box and then a, a, a latex membrane on that. So um, this is a um, one of the test results that I, I used, and there were a number of 20 or so that were used in the calibration. Um, so the, the, the dotted line is the test results with petroleum jelly, and the solid line is with latex and silicon grease. So what you can see is that the Petroleum jelly um, gave a very high shear resistance um, and the latex and silicon grease gave a much lower um, peak um, shear resistance. So those shear resistances can be converted to a friction angle and uh, tan of that value. Um, and then on the bottom here, we have the vertical versus horizontal um, so as, as it's sheared, the horizontal displacement, the top cap moves up. Uh, and this curve uh, is a plot of that vertical movement. So the, the maximum uh, rate of change of V versus H, or the angle of this um, portion over here that corresponds to this peak, is this peak dilation angle. So the sum of the, um, of the friction angle um, or the, the sum of the critical friction angle, so when this goes down to critical state, plus 0.8 of this dilation angle should, should give us this peak um, friction angle over here. So um, from the test results that I did, um, so there were tests that were set that were loose, um, where we get very low peak dilation angles and correspondingly low peak friction angles. Um, and then I also did tested dense samples. So the open symbols here uh, are the tests where we had latex and silicon grease, um, and the solid symbols are the ones with the petroleum jelly. Um, and on this graph are plotted the various flow rules. So this here, this equation is an example of a flow rule, and the one by Taylor and the one by Rowe uh, are also termed flow rules. So you can see here that the Bolton and Rowe flow rules basically plot on top of each other, whereas the Taylor flow rule plots a little bit um, below. Um, but you can see the utility of this equation um, in verifying laboratory results in that the <clears throat> latex and silicon grease values plot uh, exactly on um, this line. And at the low density samples, um, these line, these points are a little bit lower um, than that, um, the flow rules, um, but we can see that the ones with petroleum jelly, except for that point there, were far above um, this um, flow rule. So basically, if, if your points plot above this flow rule, um, then you know that you've got a problem with your results. Um, so th this equation is a very useful way um, to validate your uh, lab results. Um, so uh, I would encourage you if in your practice um, that when you get lab results, shear box, direct shear box lab results, um, insist that you get both the, um, the, shear, the shear resistance with displacement and you also get the vertical movement of the top cap with displacement and because you can use those two results to check 
whether there's anything funny going on with your results. Obviously, you need to have an estimate of your critical state friction angle, um, but that is fairly well known um, for a particular material, or it can be estimated very accurately by just um, moving this intercept and seeing where it plots through your data and whether that value is realistic or not. Okay, so what is the key thing? Um, the key thing from this first section is that dilation is that component of strength related to density. Um, and we will touch back on that. Obviously, there is much more um, to shear strength. Um, and at this point, I will just include a small advertisement for the Stellenbosch University Master's Program. Um, and obviously, if you want to learn more about uh, geotechnical engineering, I would encourage you to um, consider um, a master's degree here. And there are various options and we can discuss those if you are interested. All right, um, moving on to the, the second aspect of today's talk, which is internal erosion. Um, and there's a, a nice quote here by Victor de Mello. Um, Victor de Mello was a Brazilian geotechnical engineer um, who was very respected. He was a president of the ISSMGE for a period, um, but he once said that water has the unfortunate habit of seeping through every theory. And I think that's something that we can keep in the back of our minds whenever we look at a geotechnical engineering problem. Um, and when it comes to internal erosion, um, there were a few major internal erosion events um, in the 90s and uh, early 2000s um, and that sort of spurred a whole lot of research in this direction. Um, and there are four types of internal erosion that have been, um, or erosion has been placed into these four um, types. The, the topic that, the particular type that we will be looking at is what we call suffusion. So suffusion is basically internal erosion within one material. Um, so the loss of soil from within a soil. Um, backward erosion is where you have erosion that initiates downstream. So for example, at the toe of a uh, embankment or dike, and it moves upstream um, or under the base of the dike. Concentrated leak um, erosion is fairly similar to backward erosion. Um, but it typically develops along a pipe, for instance, or adjacent to a, a wing wall or some sort of element um, in the construction where compaction has been weak against that element. And then contact erosion is where you have erosion taking place from one material into another. Um, so for example, from a, um, a base soil uh, into a filter. Um, so that is what is termed contact erosion. So um, my research was looking particularly at this phenomenon of suffusion. Um, so suffusion is due primarily to material susceptibility uh, in that the particle size distribution contains a significant portion of fine particles which are mobile at low hydraulic gradients due to stress being carried by larger particles. This here is a, a typical material that would be susceptible um, to suffusion. So typically what you need for a material to be susceptible to suffusion is that you need a, a coarse material um, that dominates the stress transfer or the particle or the transfer of forces between particles. And in between those particles, then you have a fine material. So this example here is we have a, a, a fairly fine gravel um, about five millimeter particles, and we have a silt um, to fine sand um, that then sits between those particles. Now, um, typically these fines are non-plastic. Um, if you have plasticity uh, that can um, reduce the potential for these particles to migrate. Um, and the, this, these particular soils form naturally where they form naturally, it's typically till um, type soil, till, um, glacial tills, um, just because of the depositional and erosional environment in which they form, 
you get this very wide um, gradation. Uh, so for my work, I had to create these gradations um, by separating out um, residual granitic material. So uh, looking at some typical gradations, so this was um, a whole lot of curves that were um, compiled by some researchers in um, Norway, no, Sweden, sorry, Sweden, um, and you get wide gradations, soils with very wide gradations that are susceptible to this. So we're looking here, we've got particles all the way from 100 um, millimeters all the way to 0 0.001. So very wide gradations here. Um, and then you also get soils that have a very fine tail. So we see these soils here, they are predominant, they have a very steep um, upper section and then at about 20% um, passing, we have this very fine um, tail that then picks up. Um, so if, if you ever come across a soil with a gradation like this, um, then you should think this is potentially internally unstable or, su or potentially subject to suffusion. Now, obviously, um, we want to base our assessment on something more than just a visual um, look at the gradations. And there are no shortages of criteria or geometric criteria to determine material susceptibility. Um, and these criteria go back all the way to 1957. Um, and this one proposed by Istomina was simply based on um, your CU value. Um, so that's just based on the gradation. Um, and then there were a whole lot of criteria that were presented in 69, 75 and 79 by different people. But I guess because information flowed a bit slowly, um, they, this same criteria is credited to all of them. Um, and then in the 80s, late 80s, there was some further work done by Kenny and Lau. Um, and then um, in the last 10 years, uh, 12 years, there's been f further work um, by others. And this is probably the latest criteria, Chang and Jang in 2013. And I'm pretty sure that if we went to the literature, we would find a couple of more that have been developed, but they're all basically using the same data and fitting the data a little bit better. Um, I think for the purposes of our discussion, the the um, Kedzi or Sherrard or um, DeMello um, criteria is probably the easiest to understand. So this gradation, this uh, long dot, long dash gradation is the soil that is formed from um, this fine sand and from this fine gravel. Um, so if we work out our D85 for this fine component and our D15 for this coarse component, um, and then we work out the ratio between those two values. And if that ratio is greater than four or five, um, so that's just the normal Tazaki filter criteria, um, then that material is internally unstable. Um, so if you've got a gradation um, that you don't know what um, those components are, uh, you can simply just split that gradation at different points, um, extend that up, put that one down, work out the D85 and the D15 for those, um, the, the gradation that's separated, and you can work out if it is internally unstable or not. Um, but maybe just looking at all those criteria and there can be a little bit of confusion as which one to use, and so criteria to assess material susceptibility or internal stability continue to be refined um, with over 10 criteria proposed to date. Um, not sure how to pronounce this surname, but Chapias in 1992 showed that a lot of the earlier criteria are simply limits to the slope of the PSD. And the I called Bulletin on Internal e Erosion um, that was published in 2014 um, suggests that the Kenny and Lau uh, and the uh, Wang and Fan uh, fell, I think one criteria or permeated tests if the risk is de deemed high enough. Um, so if you if you want to look closely at those, um, that I called bulletin is probably the best place 
um, to find all those criteria and how they are defined. Now, obviously, the next thing that we need to look at in internal erosion is um, how it relates to um, the hydraulic gradient and the stress applied to the soil. Um, so we all know uh, Darcy's seepage equation, and we probably all know Tazaki's uh, heaving equation. Um, so the critical hydraulic gradient at which um, effective stresses drop uh, to zero and the material starts heaving. Now, what Skempton and Brogan in 1994 found is that with these soils, um, this critical hydraulic gradient can occur at a, um, a ratio um, or less than unity of this. So it can happen at a much lower hydraulic gradient. And this is just some pictures from the research by Skempton and Brogan in 1994. Um, so they basically had a permeator um, and they had water coming in at the base. Um, and then they had different types of material that was placed in this permeator and they determined the critical hydraulic gradient, IC, um, at which um, the material started piping. So at which point fines started emerging from the top um, of this uh, material. And this H over F min um, is basically one of the criteria. This is the Kenny and Lau criteria. Um, so at a ratio HF of 1 um, to 1 1.3 is where we have this transition. So at um, H over F below 1, um, this IC um, is significantly lower than unity. Um, so that can that shows that these particles in these internally unstable soils are held very lightly um, and they can flow out of the soil at very low hydraulic gradients. So there has been a lot more work since Skempton and Brogan in 1994 um, following the physical modeling approach. Um, so uh, Jonathan Funnen in at UBC um, has through a number of graduate students investigated this using phys physical models and have proposed some fairly elaborate envelopes um, relating I and stress, the hydraulic gradients and stress. Um, but one of the problems with physical modeling is that the, the initiation of internal erosion is a, is a grain, single grain phenomenon. So it's very hard um, to sort of scale um, from a physical test to the actual um, scale of a dam. Um, and so uh, a work by um, a lot of French researchers um, has illustrated this limitation. Um, and other work that has been done on this has been using discrete element modeling. Um, so at um, Imperial College, uh, Shire and O'Sullivan um, have done quite a lot of work uh, using discrete element modeling. Um, and obviously there are limitations um, to discrete element modeling. So perhaps just to summarize the physical modeling and discrete element modeling is that while hydraulic and stress conditions continue to be explored, the key observation is that suffusion requires gentle hydraulic conditions as stress is transferred by large particles. And um, that's obviously given we have an unstable PSD. So the key thing which we're going to carry to our conclusions um, from this review of internal erosion is that a soil, for example, a widely graded soil can lose particles over time. And that is something that we need to be uh, aware of when we have these widely graded soils or soils with very with fine tails. Now, if you weren't confused yet, um, this next slide is probably going to introduce even more confusion to the discussion. Um, in the literature on internal erosion, there have been two phenomena that have at some times been discussed interchangeably, which uh, is not a good thing, um, and sometimes without acknowledging exactly what they're talking about. So we have two terms, suffusion with a U and suffocation with an O. Now, um, it was very interesting when I was doing my literature review to see that Prof Blight in 1958 um, for his masters, he investigated filter sands um, and he actually touches on some of the issues um, that um, 
were later explored by uh, Funnen and uh, Slangen in their paper where they actually looked at all the literature and looked at every point where these two terms have been used um, and tried to define it. Sadly, they didn't quote Prof Blight's work. Um, I guess they didn't do quite as thorough a literature review as they could have, um, but they definitely looked at a lot of papers. Um, so, so, so fusion um, is basically the loss of particles with no change in arrangement of coarse particles, i.e. the coarse particles can maintain the applied loads. Whereas so fusion is when the loss of particles um, occurs with a change in the arrangement of the coarse particles. So coarse particles can no longer maintain applied loads. So from, from a um, dam safety point of view, suffusion is not too bad because although you're losing fine particles, uh, the coarse particles can still maintain the loads. Whereas if you have suffusion, the loss of the fine particles is far more detrimental. Um, so distinguishing when you have suffusion and when you have suffusion is very important from a stability point of view. Um, so to try and understand um, these two distinct phenomena, um, I started to put together a, a, a theoretical framework um, to try and understand how the fabric changes as the finer fraction F uh, increases. So basically the scenario we have is where we have very coarse particles, and then in between those coarse particles, we have very fine particles. So this fine part, these fine particles would be even smaller than that dot. Um, but so that we could see it, I've just included one dot. So these curves here um, may look a bit confusing, but hopefully they aren't. Um, so basically, when we have a bimodal soil, um, Initially, when we have no, fi no fine material, so when there's no, none of these smaller particles at 0%, the void ratio of the overall soil is equal to the um, void ratio of the coarse particles, EC. As we start to add fine particles to the soil, um, and we assume that our coarse particles are at the densest they can be. So they are as close to po as possible to each other, and we're just adding in fines in between. Um, and as we add fines, the overall void ratio is going to decrease because we are using up more of the airspace in between the coarse particles, but the void ratio of the coarse component is going to remain the same. Now, as we add more and more fine material, those fine particles are going to start to pack closer and closer to each other. Um, so the void ratio of the finer particles, EF, uh, is going to decrease um, to this point um, where the fine particles are becoming so abundant that the only way we can get more fine particles into our arrangement is by pushing these coarse particles further apart from each other. Um, and so at that point, the coarse void ratio starts to increase um, and the fine void ratio, the void ratio of the fine particles in between starts to become constant. And at this point here, um, the overall void ratio of this arrangement is going to start increasing again um, because the, of this increase in the void ratio of the coarse particles. So this is this is a, a theoretical um, proposition as to how um, the void ratio of the different components changes as we add more and more finer material. Now, I, I must be quite clear at this point that when I say finer fraction, um, it's not the traditional definition of fines in that particles that are smaller than 75 microns. Um, finer fraction is that component of the gradation that will erode out. Um, so that portion of the gradation that is unstable um, when subjected to flow. So try not to get those two um, definitions of fine, finer particles and fines confused. So to try and understand how um, this 
relationship actually plays out in real life. Uh, I went back to that um, the soil the, that I had initially where we've got this fine sand plus this fine gravel. Um, and I made different combinations of the soil for different percentages of F. So basically, F of 15 meant that I had 15% of S um, in my gradation. So that was varied between um, 0 and 40%. Now, um, I looked at a both dense um, and loose um, soils. So the, this, these top points here, this um, square here and the round point over there, um, are the loosest arrangement of the coarse particles. So the E max of the only the coarse particles, so there's no finer fraction. Um, and then this bottom point here is the densest arrangement of coarse particles. So um, I'm going to discuss first the, the dense samples. So for the dense samples, we started at this point, the densest arrangement of coarse particles, and we slowly added more finer material. Um, and then I will then look at this graph where we start at the loosest arrangement of coarse particles and we slowly add uh, more finer material. Okay, so what do we see here? Um, we see that the, the overall gradation uh, or the overall void ratio doesn't quite get as low as um, was predicted for a bimodal material um, and it sort of flattens out um, at about a finer fraction of about 15%. Um, up to that finer fraction of 15%, the arrangement of the coarse particles in their densest arrangement remains pretty much the same. Um, so these finer particles are fitting snugly in between the coarse particles. As we transition from a finer fraction of 15 to 27 over here, at a 27, at 27%, what happens is that the fine material has pushed the coarser particles further apart than EC max. Now, EC max is basically the, the stablest, the loosest stable arrangement of coarse particles. So at any EC above EC max, um, if you were to suddenly remove all the finer particles, that arrangement would just crumble. Um, there wouldn't be any um, stability in it. Um, so we can do the same thing with um, a loose arrangement, um, but for the loose arrangement, basically as soon as we up to about 10% finer fraction, um, EC um, max is maintained, but after that any further addition of fine particles um, increases that EC. So the, the, in reality, if you are constructing something, you would never have a assemblage of particles in such a loose state. But how does this come back? Um, how does this help us inform um, decisions about suffusion and suffocation and internal stability? Well, from, from those um, curves, we can define three regions. So the first region is where we have suffusion. So suffusion is where we have fines loss with no impact on strength. We have zone two where we have suffocation, where strength is impacted. Um, and then zone three where the, um, the arrangement is such that it's very unlikely that the fine particles will be lost. Um, so just to summarize that, suffusion the void ratio of the coarse particles remains constant despite fines being added, and that's below um, FT, the threshold um, fines content. Um, so Foshin, um is where we have the void ratio of the coarse particles increases, but the majority of fines are not load bearing because the coarse structure is still stable because it's below EC max and that's below FC which is the critical fines, finer um, percentage of fines. Um, and then we have the zone three internally stable. So the coarse particles are in an unstable arrangement without the presence of fines. 
And what that means is that fines are critical to load bearing because those coarse particles are basically floating in the fine material. Um, and so they, the fines are carrying a large percentage of the loads. Um, so that was obviously just for one grading where we determined FT and FC. Um, so I went to the literature and said, can we find other studies where they have um, investigated the packing behavior of um, various soils? Um, and I found uh, another 10 studies um, that I then analyzed in the way that I've just presented. Um, and these soils um, had various uh, internal filter ratios. So this here is a value of um, four, um, and that's the Kedzie 1969 criteria. So any filter ratio above four would be an internally unstable soil, and below would be um, internally stable. Um, and the solid um, symbols are gravel sand mixtures, and the open ones are sand silt mixtures. Um, and so what we see is that the transition finer fraction rapidly increases after an internal filter ratio of about four. Um, and some more recent research has suggested that this critical um, transition is closer to an internal filter ratio of about six. Um, so that would concur better with the results that um, I found from looking at the, um, the packing behavior in these soils. So basically what this means is that for internally unstable soils, um, there is a, a, a much higher percentage of fines that can potentially be lost. Um, and then if we look at the critical fine fraction, so that is the um, percentage of finer material at which they start to carry a significant portion of the load. Um, we see that there isn't much difference um, between uh, stable soils and unstable soils. There is a slight increase, um, but the, on average, they were a lot higher than what we found in um, my current study. Um, so the, this was around about um, 33%, um, and in this prior chart, this was about 17%. So I took those two values and said, okay, is there any is there any field evidence to suggest that um, these transition finer fractions are of relevance? So these are all um, case histories that Rongfist and Bicklinder, um, so the researchers from Sweden, um, and they looked at the gradations where there were sinkholes, erosion channels, or crest collapse. Uh, one, two, three were particular um, anomalous results. So those are those top ones up there. Um, we don't really, uh, I can't actually recall exactly what they are. Um, but what we see is that a large portion of these soils fall between these FT and FC boundaries. So the percentage of fines or finer fraction um, involved in these um, incidents uh, or events fall between these um, two boundaries. So it suggests that the boundaries that that I was that I've suggested um, are fairly uh, realistic, uh, and that there is field evidence that we can take these micro observations to the macro. So just um, what, what is the key thing that we need to keep in mind from what I've just presented? Um, the key thing is that small losses of finer particles, perhaps around 15%, may have a limited impact on strength. Um, so having a looked at internal erosion, um, this was then what I investigated further. Is can we actually um, find evidence that this 15% is... Um, a potential threshold. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just going to drink some water. So the, <clears throat> the theoretical framework appears to make sense considering packing behavior and field observations, 
but can this change in behavior be shown in the laboratory? So that was the next step of my analysis. So basically what I was proposing is that if the percentage of finer material is below FT, um, we should have negligible settlement and a negligible change in strength. If FT, if F, sorry, is between FT and FC, we should have some settlement um, and a change in strength. So the loads should still be carried predominantly by the coarse particles as the finer material um, is removed. So we shouldn't get much settlement. But if we shear it, um, because we've lost those finer particles that contribute to the um, void ratio, um, we should have a change in strength. And if F is greater than FC, um, we should have large settlements because the, the finer fraction is very important um, to the load bearing um, structure. So again, returning to this gradation, um, what I did in my experimental um, work was for this fine sand gradation, S, um, I did tests where this was made up of sand, actual um, residual granite material, and I also did tests with salt. So the reason for using salt, um, normal table salt, um, which was sieved out into appropriate sizes. Um, the local pick and pay did quite a lot of business. Um, was that draining the, so the salt out enabled me to model the loss of particles in a realistic time period. Um, because obviously if I wanted to erode the sand out, um, it might take me um, a few months to a few years to get all the particles out. Um, and I was a bit impatient with my PhD for that. Um, and so the F was varied um, uh, again, and this is just the experimental setup. Um, earlier, I showed you a cross section through this device. Um, so you can see here is the source of water. So seepage under one dimensional compression um, was undertaken. And so I monitored the settlement. There's the LVDT. Uh, and then out of this tube came the seepage, and every so often I would um, collect a sample. Uh, there should be a glass beaker somewhere in the picture. I can't see it now, um, but I would collect a sample and then I would test the resistivity or the conductivity of the sample. And obviously with saline water, you would have um, high conductivity. Um, but as soon as you'd got rid of all the salt, the conductivity would drop. And, and so when those two conditions had been met, I would then I then shear the sample um, in direct shear to see how this shear strength had been influenced. So turning our attention first to settlement. Um, so I did tests at 150 kPa normal stress, and then I also did tests at 75 kPa. Um, and we'll look first at the tests of 150 at 150 kPa. And if you want to read more um, about these tests, there is a paper in the Proceedings of the Institute of Civil Engineers, Geotechnical Engineering, uh, with myself, Peter Day, and Irvin Luca. Um, so I would encourage you to get that paper if you want to have a look a bit closer at these results uh, and the experimental methodology. Um, so maybe just to explain all these um, points here. So this was the initial co course void ratio. Um, so if we took out all the fines and worked out what the um, course void ratio was, um, we could get these points here. Uh, and then this on this side was the dissolved or saturated course void ratio. Um, so what was the what happened to that course void ratio after we had saturated? Now, if the loss of fines had absolutely no effect on the course void ratio, we would expect all our points to plot along this line of unity. Um, and these SPs, settlement potential, um, that's basically exactly the same as how you calculate collapse potential. Um, and so 0% is that line of unity, that is 5% collapse, 
for settlement potential, and that's 10% settlement potential. So the sodded points here are where we had all sand fines. Um, so that's where we just had, we, none of the fines are being lost during the saturation or dissolving process. Um, and as we would expect, um, there was very little collapse that took place. Now, the reason why those points don't all fit exactly on 0% is that the fine particles um, under the seepage do rearrange somewhat and the sample moves into a slightly denser packing. Um, and that obviously is, um, so basically as we go along here, we are increasing the percentage of finer material in our soil. Um, so these points here, we have a, a very large percentage of finer particles, and as a consequence, um, we have a slight departure. So the solid symbols are all salt fines, um, so all the sand fines are replaced with salt, um, and then in some of the tests, only half of the sand was replaced with salt, and then in uh, some of the tests, only a quarter of the sand was replaced with salt. So if we look at the all salt fines, um, so we get a little bit of collapse when the fines are lost below F22, but it's still uh, very negligible um, in terms of the settlement potential. And then as we transition from uh, F of a finer fraction of 22% to a finer fraction of 28, we start getting more settlement taking place. Um, and then obviously at very high finer fractions, we get fairly significant settlement uh, or collapse taking place. Um, and then as we would expect, when we are only um, replacing a small or portion of the sand, um, we get significantly less collapse taking place. So it's more than likely that between the threshold and the critical finer fraction, um, not all the fines are lost. Whereas below at very at lower than F of about 15 to 22 percent, we can expect that pretty much all the fines would be lost. Um, so if we look at the results at 75 kPa, um, we have very similar trends um, as at 150 kPa. Um, and these points here, so in this case, we only had all salt fines. We didn't do quarter or half. Um, we see that we have significantly less um, collapse or settlement that takes place as those fines are lost. All right, so now turning our attention to shear strength. So um, what uh, we have here is the shear resistance and the bottom curves are the dilation. Now, for 5% um, um, of sand, and this was 6% of salt, um, we couldn't quite match up the percentage of sand and salt because there was a slight complication in exactly how the, the two packed. So sand packs a little bit differently to the to how salt packs. Um, so to create the same coarse void ratio, we had to use slightly different percentages of sand and salt. Um, but these are comparable results in terms of coarse void ratio at the beginning of the test. Um, so we see that there is a slight drop in the shear resistance, um, but there's virtually no change in the dilation angle. For 15%, so this is at the proposed threshold, um, we start seeing quite a, um, a change in the shear resistance, but again, very little change in um, the dilation angle. Um, once we start moving to um, 30, um, so a very high percentage of sand, um, uh, percentage of finer material that can be eroded out. We see we have a big decline in the peak friction angle and a significant change in the dilation angle. Um, and then this is just an example where we have only half of the material being lost. Um, so at higher um, percentages of finer material, if only half of the material is lost, we don't see as a dramatic um, loss in strength as we do uh, when all the fine particles are lost. Um, so looking at tests at 75 kPa, 
Again, fairly similar results for low percentages of finer material that can be lost. Basically no change in peak shear resistance and no change in dilation angle. Um, and then obviously as the percentage of finer material increases, um, we have a significant drop in peak friction angle and a significant drop in dilation angle. So bringing all these results um, together, um, so all the, the tests, all this will, I think just for time, we'll consider all sand fines and all salt fines. So there's solid symbols and the open round symbols. Um, so if we look at the peak um, resistance, um, the peak resistance uh, doesn't change that much for the various finer fraction percentages, but we see that as the, those fines are lost um, in the internal erosion process, we have a significant drop in um, shear resistance. Uh, and so that drop, if we look at the difference between that trend line and that trend line, um, the difference, the change in the friction angle um, is about zero at, as you would expect, when um, no fines are lost um, to about a change in friction angle of about nine degrees um, when we lose a significant portion of those fines. Um, and this is matched in the dilation angle. Um, so zero uh, going to about nine degrees uh, over here. So what's interesting here is to note that the, the change in the, the friction angle is as a consequence of the change in the dilation angle. Um, and if we remember earlier that what uh, the dilation angle relates to, the dilation angle relates to the packing um, of the material. So basically what is happening, and we can see it here, that if we just test the coarse material uh, in its loosest packing, um, these are the results uh, in terms of dilation angle and in peak um, shear resistance, we see that the um, these trend lines are tending towards those states. Um, so what is happening is that the fine particles, as they are lost, they are causing a soil that was once dense due to the presence of fines to be a soil that is loose. Um, and the reason why it is loose is because under the one dimensional loading, um, the stresses can be carried by the coarse particles. But as soon as you apply shear, um, it, um, there are no fines between the coarse particles to absorb that shear um, force. Okay, so turning again to the test at 75 kPa, we have a similar trend, um, all sand, and then once the sand has been lost or the finer particles lost, and again, um, looking at the dilation angles, um, and again, we have good agreement fairly good agreement between the loss in friction angle and the loss in the dilation angle. Um, and obviously, because dilation um, is less, um, there is less, these are at a lower stress, so we don't have as much um, dilation um, being developed, or there's not a lot of settlement taking place. Um, okay, so, the, the theoretical framework appears to make sense. Um, so the work that we found showed that when F was lower than FT for the gradation that we looked at, there was negligible settlement and a negligible change in strength. Um, however, when F was between FT and FC, we had some settlement, um, but the settlement wasn't sufficient to cause the sample to, be, to remain dense. And as a consequence, when it was sheared, the strength reduced. Um, and the tests where we had F above FC, we had large settlements taking place. Uh, the, the key thing to take away from the uh, experimental work that um, I did was that internal erosion reduces particle interlock, i.e. dilation, but this does depend on the percentage of finer particles present. So in concluding my presentation, just taking the four main conclusions that I have 
um, spoken about during my presentation. The first thing is that dilation is that component of strength related to density. Um, a soil, for example, a widely graded soil, can lose particles over time, and we should consider the impact of that on the behavior of the soil. Um, however, small losses of finer particles, around about 15%, may have a limited impact on strength, and I think um, that may be a bit over, est over uh, estimated, uh, not sufficiently cautious, and maybe it should be around 10%. Um, and internal erosion reduces particle interlock, i.e. dilation, but this depends on percentage of finer particles. Okay, thank you. That brings me to the end of um, my presentation. Thank you for that, Dr. McRobert. That was a very, very interesting lecture, actually. Um, great. Okay, so uh, to all the attendees, you'll note that uh, during the lecture I, I did post uh, a link for you to fill out for attendance i've i've noticed um quite a few people have already filled this out if you if you haven't filled it out please fill it out it's for cpd points okay with that you'll notice i've now opened the question and answer section so please feel free post your questions um charles yeah uh, we'll, we'll take a couple of questions i i think we've got about 15, 20 minutes, Let, let's see how time goes, but over to you again. Okay, thanks. Okay, Charles, it's, uh, it's obviously such a good lecture. There's no questions. Um, there, there might be a bit of a delay, like we discussed earlier, about a 20 second delay between between us and what the attendees see. So I think let, let's just give it uh, a couple of moments and we'll, we'll see. Perfect. Charles, I can see a few questions yes. coming through. Can you see them on your side? I, I can see them. Um, okay, great. I will um, look at them and then I'll respond. So the the, the first question um, is it possible? Is it potentially possible that a soil classified as a suffusion type? could be potentially collapsible soil if further internal erosion took place. Um, so I think that that is sort that is basically what is taking place is that the as the as the finer particles are lost, um, you you sort of are ending up with a a a very um, loose arrangement of coarse particles. Um, and that that arrangement of coarse particles, um is very easily disturbed um, and so that is what um, the collapse is so i think whether a suffusion type could potentially become collapsible i think by def definition of what a suffusion type soil is um no but if it is a suffusion type of soil then definitely yes a collapsible soil is um 
the collapse of the grain structure will take place once the fines are um, a sufficient number of fines are lost. Um, hopefully that answers your question, um, Patrick. Um, the next question is from um, Bazi or Bazi. Can critical state soil mechanics be used to explain some of the theories, such as those relating to the state parameter, um, e.g. by Mike Jeffries? Um, yeah, so I had I um, made a bit of a stab at trying to figure out how it would fall within a um, critical state um, framework. Uh, and basically what you have is you, what I, what I hypothesized is that you basically, you have two critical states at play. You have the critical state applying to the coarser material um, and you have a critical state applied to the, the, the whole soil. Um, but it's fairly speculative at this point and would require a lot of investigation um, to get it to a state where we can sort of discuss it in more detail. Um, and uh, one of my examiners said that um, it was promising, but required a lot more work. Um, so I, I think just for the sake of, of today's lecture, um, if that person is interested, they are welcome to email me, macrobert at sun.ac.za. Um, and we can discuss that further. Um, okay, uh, then a, a stage further in research would be the effects of cementation. Um, yeah, uh, obviously that, that would be something that um, could be investigated further. Um, I haven't looked particularly uh, at cementation. Uh, most of the research has been done in the context of earth embankment dams. Um, and so they sort of have been compacted, but they haven't really been around long enough for extensive cementation to take place. Um, but it is obviously something that could be investigated further. Um, Okay, there's a question about uh, granites being notorious for dispersion. Uh, the fact that you use granite sand, i.e. soluble albite and orthoclase minerals, could it not have dissolved together with the salt and caused the skewed results? Would silica sand not have been a safer choice? Um, so yes, obviously the, the interaction between the different minerals was something that was important. Uh, and so to look at how that happened, um, we actually did uh, carried out gradations of the soil before and after the testing. Um, and none of those, um, we actually, so after the test was done, the whole shear box was placed in a, in a deep freezer um, so that we could main, get the, a good idea of what the structure of the soil or the sheared sample looked like. Um, and then we, by doing gradation analysis, there wasn't any evidence that within the experimental time frame um, that there was any uh, funny mineralogy reaction taking place. Um, but obviously that could be investigated further. Um, Okay, a note that you said that the grading had to be that of a till, the reason for this and applicability to South Africa. Um, so I, I think that, that that comment was more to say that the, the soils that are often most um, prone to this type of um, internal erosion are till, glacial till type soils. Um, so I guess the applicability to South Africa in terms of um, glacial till soils is limited, um, but a lot of soils that are used in um, pavement structures um, often 
uh, can potentially be um, internally erodible. Um, and a lot of mine type uh, wastes, um, often because you are combining um, different um, types of waste streams that can have very uh, wide uh, differences in gradation, um, this problem can come up. I think when I when I started at WITS, um, I did some uh, work on uh, mixed coal discard and coal fines um, permeability to see whether the combined product would result in a less permeable material. Um, but what we found, and we had to set up fairly large permeators um, and uh, had to use um, parts of the hydraulic lab just to get the amount of water through the um, 300 millimeter, I think it was, it was 500 millimeter diameter permeator. Um, and what we found was that all the coal fines just washed out um, from between the coarse particles. Um, so there, there definitely is um, applicability of this research to South Africa, um, but I, most of the research has originated from studying glacial tills. Um, uh, Andrew Copeland asks, is the typical rat holing experience on gold and iron ore tailings dams the same as internal erosion or just a dispersive soil? Um, I guess it's, yeah, the, the problem with answering that internal erosion is sort of a coverall phase phrase for all sorts of different um, modes of um, internal erosion. So I, I didn't mention dispersive soil on my slide. Um, on the on the Ghana and Fanon um, categorization, um, but in the I called bulletin, dispersive soils are included. I, I would say that that, that rat holing on gold and iron ore tailings dams is is not suffusion or suffocation um, because you don't typically have that wide gradation. Um, and it's probably just a dispersive soil, but I am going out on a limb on that. Um, so I am uh, open for correction. Um, the next question is, how does chemistry of water causing erosion affect the speed extent of erosion and erosion susceptibility of potentially less erodible soils? Um, Unfortunately, I um, uh, am not a expert in soil chemistry or water chemistry. Uh, and during my literature review, I um, didn't read up uh, particularly on that. Um, and it's obviously something that um, should be considered um, as well. Um, if 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 the water chemistry was anything that was not, um, that isn't really what we usually expect. So if there's maybe potentially, um, but I think that's sort of also going into the dispersive soils um, side of things where soil chemistry and water chemistry has, has a large influence. Um, question from Jan. How often is suffusion or suffocation a failure mode for soil structures as opposed to contact and other erosion mechanisms? Uh, I don't have the exact figures, um, but the a lot of this research um, was initiated in the when the uh, the the WAC Bennett Dam and um, British Columbia, um, it's it's not the dam wall is not the highest in, in North America, but the body of water um, contained is the largest body of water in, in North America. So what happened is that two sinkholes developed um, at the at the crest of the dam, uh, and there, so that's that's one sort of standout case study, um, and it also a lot of dams in um, the Scandinavian countries have been impacted by this suffusion and suffocation process. So I think the best the best um, 
if you looked at if you look at the work by Viklander and Ronkvist, um, they they have detailed um, all the, the the dams that have had um, incidents associated to suffusion and suffocation. There, I don't think uh, I speak under correction, but most of the times suffusion and suffocation is result is more related to incidents uh, rather than actual failures. Um, because it's typically um, sinkholes or sort of rat holes or um, that form as the fines are lost uh, along sort of conduits. Um, but the, the work by Wicklinder and Ronkvist um, would perhaps be able to answer that question best. Okay, there's a there's a interesting question that in some areas in Botswana we have earth fissures developing after heavy rains, um, and this happens in non-dolomitic areas. So there has been a suspicion of internal erosion. Um, yeah, I think I would probably need um, more information about that to give a a decent answer to that question. Um, and you're welcome to contact me. Um, for further um, discussion on it, um, I think there there doesn't there don't seem to be any further questions, Brett. Yeah, um, just looking through, I, I don't see anything further. Um, just having a look a look at the time as well. I think. I think it's it's good enough to to call it an evening. Um, okay. You, you know we've you, you've given out your your email address. If if anyone does have any further questions, uh, they're more than welcome to either email yourself or, or myself, and and I'll get in touch with you and pass on the the information to you. I'm also okay. contactable via LinkedIn if anyone um, finds it easier to get my details there. Okay. All right. Okay. So. Um, I, I think that's it for today. So, um, Charles, on, on behalf of uh, everyone who attended the GeoDiv committee, myself, uh, thank you very much for, for your time today. And um, li like your last post on LinkedIn, let's hope it's not another 10 or 11 years before you give another <laughs> evening lecture. So, yeah. yeah. OK. Um, All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for everyone who um, listened um, and um, uh, yeah, thank you for attending. It's a pity that I can't see your faces and interact with you over a, a nice cool drink, um, but I, I guess it is nice that I can present um, from the comfort of my office as well. So thank you very much for your time and for inviting me to give this talk. Perfect. Okay, to, to all the attendees, thank you for joining us today. Um, our next online event will be the PhD research study of Dr. Tiago Gaspar, which is Powered Foundations for Wind Turbines in Unsaturated Expansive Soils. The, the date we're looking at is about the, the 20th of May, but um, all of that would be confirmed in the next couple of weeks, and we will obviously send out uh, the invitation closer to the time. Okay, again, Dr. McRobert, thank you very much for tonight. Thank you to all the attendees. Um, that's it. Have a wonderful evening and goodbye for now. Goodbye.